It's really a for you guys. Okay. So we're going to come back to the code dominance practice at the end. I want to, like I said, finish these notes up. This is slide 36. Um, we've kind of mentioned this, um, but humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Obviously, we know that. The last pair is what determines the sex of the organism. So is it a male or a female? So the father has an option of giving the X allele for that or the Y allele. Okay, because a father is called the X, it is represented with XY. The female or the mother has an X and an X. So the only allele or version of the sex trait that a mother has to offer is the X. So really it's the father that determines the gender of the new offspring. Okay, so mothers only have the one option to give, the father has the option of giving an X or giving a Y. If the father gives an X, then the, the child will be a girl. If the father gives a Y, then the offspring will be a boy. Yes? I've heard of this thing, um, it's where you can have outside of one gender, but inside of another gender. What? Yeah, I don't know. We're gonna leave that alone. Okay, males have an XY chromosome, and obviously they got the X from the mom and the Y from the dad making the offspring a man. And this is kind of visually how, you, it, it's showing the singles, not showing the pairs, but showing, um, these are all our autosome chromosomes, so all the cells in our body besides our last pair, which are the sex cells, um, and those are shown here. So this is showing a male because you see the X and the Y. If this was a female, then you'd have the X and another X. And it's the same idea, right? You would get an option of getting either this one or an option of getting this one because of that law, uh, principle of segregation that we talked about with Mendel yesterday. And so the last topic, don't be sad, the last science expert topic is pedigrees. Yes. Okay, these pedigrees, and if you um, if you have a dog that's registered, you might get, have the dog's pedigree. I know like on our horse papers, the registration papers, it has their pedigree, it has their name, it has their parents, it has their grandparents, and then the great grandparents, that keeps going, right? Um, that's what a pedigree is. It's showing generations um, coming from one person going back. It's kind of like a family tree. Exactly, mm -hmm. yep. And so it's a diagram that shows the occurrence and the appearance of phenotypes of a particular gene from one generation to the next. The difference with these pedigrees is it's showing us some genetic stuff. So it's not just listing names like most of our pedigrees that we might see for our animals or a family tree. We can actually apply some of this genetics to it. We can apply the traits and we'll see what that looks like. So we are gonna use symbols to represent people and lines to represent relationships. And you're like, what? So like we're making stick figures? Not exactly. Look, it's something like this in a minute. So we're gonna say squares are kind of like rectangles are gonna be for the males. Circle shapes are gonna be for the females. Horizontal lines connecting male and, fan, uh, male and female, so like mating. And then lines coming down are showing the children that result from that cross. If the shape, the square or the circle is shaded in, then that person is affected by the trait. So maybe by sickle cell or maybe by color blindness or maybe Hodgkinson's disease. If it's half shaded, then the person is a carrier, meaning they're heterozygous for it, and they don't have the um, trait, but they're carrying it. So like I would be a carrier for blue eyes. I don't have blue eyes, but I have that gene where I could pass that on, okay? Um, obviously we're talking heterozygous, so being a, the, 
typically these traits are recessive. So if you're carrying it, you're not showing it, but you have it, which is not new information. It's like, that's how we've always said. Um, so females are going to be our circles. Males are going to be our squares. So here we have, like, this would be like the grandma and grandpa generation. Then they have four kids. This kid is married to this circle, right? this lady. And then they ended up having two children. Or assuming. Or assuming. Or assuming. So in generation one, is it the grandmother or the grandfather, the male or the female, who has the, the affected trait? The female. Good, because she has the shaded in shape. some or all, I think it's just some, where it's like a sickle bar shape, like a sickle shape, kind of like a crescent moon, instead of being a circle. So it's just kind of like, you know, partial. Um, it, they call it sickle cell because it looks kind of like a sickle, um, like that sickle shape, um, but it's kind of like a crescent moon shape. And so this can be a problem because your blood cells need to flow through your blood, through the plasma and stuff. And so the round ones, it's kind of like um, tubes floating down a lazy river, right? They bump and they can just kind of float around. Sickle cells, because they're not perfectly round, they get stuck. And so that can cause some complications. Um, so both of these individuals have sickle cell, and we see that because they're shaded in, and it tells us, but it won't always, we won't always have this little narrative, okay? They have four children, here, 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 and here. Three have sickle cell and one does not. These three are shaded, letting us know that they also have sickle cell. Thomas has no, it's not shaded, so he does not. One child, Abby, um, has sickle cell and has children with Theo. You know, we know that because you see this cross, like it's a connection, a marriage, and then we have resulting children. It looks like they end up with four children Two have normal cells, one has the sickle cell. So we want to determine if Bob, what is his percentage or probability that Bob will have the sickle cell trait? So you might be like, what? Like, how do we even like go about this? How will we even start it? Well, we can make a pun and square, right? That's what we learned how to do pun and squares for is to make probability. So this would be like a real life kind of situation that it can be used for. My pen will work, that would be great. Okay, so we know that this sickle cell is going to be, oh, back a bit, um, is gonna be um, something that is recessive. Because if it was dominant, then we would see it you know, in all of them. So if we have, so let's make sure we've read everything. So one child, Abby, has sickle cell, has children with Theo who has normal cells. So we know if we're gonna say, um, let's call the letter, uh, let's do B's for blood because S's are kind of hard to see the difference. So we're gonna say that Abby is little B, little B because she's she has, the sickle cell, um, sickle cells, right? So if we know that two of them did not have the sickle cell, right, and one does, we're assuming that Theo is probably going to be heterozygous because he has an offspring that has it, meaning he had to have given hit a little b to combine with one of Abby's little bees to have carry have sickle cell. 
Otherwise, if she was not a sickle cell person, then we wouldn't know for sure if he was heterozygous or homozygous dominant. But because she is, we know that he has to have one of those recessive alleles to donate. So if we set up a Punnett square with this, and it's going to be kind of small, um, yeah, that's probably the best place to put it. Um, I'm going to do the Abby's here and Theo's here, right? So we have big B, little b, little, little, big, little, little, little. And so Bob will have a 50-50 chance of having the sickle cell or not having the sickle cell. If it matches our 50-50 ratio, um, which it doesn't have to exactly, but if we already have one that has it, good chance, still 50% chance, but um, that he would end up being a sickle cell um, person. So that's how you can um, use these pedigrees and the punnett squares together to kind of make predictions, okay? So that's kind of sophisticated. Like you have to be able to, like, to look at this and know that he would have to be heterozygous, know that she would have to be a homozygous recessive, um, and so it, it's a little bit more in depth than they're going to have you do like on your state test, um, but it is kind of good to know. Okay, so I had said that we would talk about um, some disorders that can happen. Um, we talked about obviously cancers can happen during meiosis and mitosis, um, but there are some disorders that happen genetically, not just like random, um, but you know they can get passed on like the sickle cell. So there can be defects caused by new mutations or changes to the DNA, which again, those can be caused from outside sources like radiation, can be caused just during regular meiosis and mitosis. Those types of things are not gonna be genetic. Um, those are just like a random, unique to that individual or that individual cell. Things that are genetically passed on, um, are associated with a certain gene with a certain allele. Okay, so it's kind of very specific. Um, there are things that are called sex-linked traits. So more men are colorblind than women. It is a sex-linked trait to the Y chromosome. So that's why men have um, more of an issue with this. Same thing with male powdered baldness. Why do men become bald but women don't? which, oh, that'd be really weird, right? If we had a bunch of bald women, we wouldn't be used to that, so it's weird. But what if it was the other way around, right? What if it was more likely for a woman, right? It's, the reasoning is because it's attached to that Y chromosome. Women don't have the Y chromosome. So if there's some kind of issue that is on the Y chromosome, it's going to be isolated just primarily to men. Right. Now, there are a few colorblind women, and there are some women that have thinning, kind of balding hair. That is not necessarily going to be because they have a Y chromosome, obviously, um, but that's why we see it more on men than women, because of the Y. Um, thank goodness a lot of our um, disorders or syndromes or issues are recessive because obviously we know it takes two of those recessive, so the chance that two recessive people um, end up having a child and that child gets the, the recessive trait um, is, is less likely, which is a good thing. So cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, spinal muscular dystrophy, all of those things, like Huntington's disease, Hodgkin's disease, all of those are recessive disorders or diseases, and so at least that's not a dominant thing where a lot more people would be affected. Yes? That to me is not the lack of a dog. Exactly. You're getting your card shuffled, right? Um, I have a friend and her son and daughter-in-law um, have one, two children now, but the daughter has, the daughter-in-law has something, some kind of genetic thing that is recessive with her thyroid. And there's, and it can get passed on and it can be, she's a carrier, she doesn't have it. Um, and I can't remember exactly like what happens, but it can be very, very deadly. And so her husband, which is my friend's son, 
he went and got the blood test to see to make sure that he wasn't a carrier because they were afraid that if you know she's a carrier and he's a carrier they would have a 50 percent chance of one of their children getting this issue and thank goodness he was dominant he was homozygous dominant so he was not a carrier meaning that even if she passed on the recessive allele he would always pass on the dominant and so their children were okay from that so Kind of there's another real life application of this um, so it is good to know if there is some kind of genetic issue and then like as you're you know end up getting married and thinking children down the road you know you you have all the information ahead of time and then obviously sometimes there's just a mistake that happens randomly um, down syndrome is not something that is hereditary it's not something that gets passed on um, but it is a mistake and we talked about this it's on chromosome number 21, there's an extra chromosome, okay? And so, you again, we had said, like, hey, you think that extra information is a good thing? It's not. It's overload. It's like the, the body gets really confused and things don't totally form right. That's why there's you know, a lot of times a shorter lifespan. Um, there can be some major issues, um, you know, and developmentally and things like that. So it's just there's confusion. And, and that happens at random. Now this again isn't a genetic disorder that gets passed on to subsequent um, offspring or anything like that. It's just like a random, oh, this one gets an extra, okay? All right, let's look at this last one where we're gonna combine our hundred square idea and pedigrees. So we have the males are our squares, the females are our circles. And it tells us, and I know it's really small, colorblind is going to be orange. So the dark color is our colorblind. Normal vision is going to be yellow. Um, and then if it has half and half, that person is a carrier. So you know a carrier is going to be heterozygous. So let's do the letter N. So for normal. So the yellow is normal. Right, so we know he has a capital N. We know that she's gonna have a big N and a little N because she has one of each. She can either get the color blindness or she can give the normal allele, okay? And so it says, what are the chances third generation Allie has a child affected by color blindness if she marries a color blind mate or male, male? All right, so color blind, her husband is going to be little N, little N. She's going to be um, big N, little n. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's her brother. She's going to marry little n, little n. Sorry. I mean, it's legal in some sense. I mean, we're going to just say, we're just glad that that never happened. Okay? Never happened. Okay, so it says she marries a colorblind male. So we know he would be little, little. Okay, so All right, so now let's make our Punnett square. I'm going to change colors so I can write in that blue. All right, so Allie is capital N, little n, and her future husband, my brother, my brother, is little n, little n. Heterozygous, homozygous, recessive. Okay, so we do the cross. And we get this. So what percentage of their children, or what percentage of probability is it that a child would be colorblind? 50%. 50%. Yes. I know a family that all of their kids colorblind. Really? So what do you think the parents have to be? Well, two options, really. One is not. Okay, so it's kind of like this, right? So it's not saying that out of four children, two will have it and two won't. It's saying for one child, you have a 50-50 chance. For the next child, you have a 50-50 chance. It just so happened that they all got the 50% chance of having it. Interesting. So one of the parents is a colorblind, one is not. Very cool. Um, now you kind of know why, like, or understand, like, how they could have figured that out. What is it? Low end. I don't know. Don't have. He is. 
He's red brown colorblind. Oh my my dad is mega mega colorblind. Like I walked into his house, I was like, oh I like your gray paint, and he's like gray.